In 1932, eight years before The Long Winter was published, Rose Wilder Lane sent her literary agent George by a synopsis for a new novel she proposed to write. Its working title was The Hard Winter. She explained, there was a lot of fun through it all. Everybody starved, but nobody died. Lane's project didn't go anywhere. And by the time she chose to write about the hard winter of 1880-1881 in her novel Free Land, published in 1938, her approach resembled her mother's in both Pioneer Girl and eventually The Long Winter. The experience wasn't fun. It was hard. A long, hard struggle to survive, a battle against starvation. That was the beginning of the hard winter, Lane wrote in Free Land. No such weather has been known since then. At the time, men spoke as if that country intended to drive out or kill the settlers who had come into it. They never felt that the blizzard quit. It paused only to gather strength for greater violence. In Pioneer Girl, Wilder herself described the hard winter as a malignant power of destruction, wreaking havoc as long as possible then pausing for breath to go on with the work. Or as Pa forcibly put it, the blizzard just let go to spit on its hands. As you can see here, Wilder personifies the blizzard. And in her own way, so did Lane. The blizzard paused only to gather strength for greater violence. In The Long Winter, Wilder takes this personification to a new level. The long winter itself becomes a kind of character in the novel. It is Lara's antagonist. Sometimes in the night, half awake and cold, Lara half dreamed that the roof was scoured thin. Horribly, the great blizzard, large as the sky, bent over it and scoured with an enormous invisible cloth round and round on the paper-thin roof till a hole wore through, and squealing, chuckling, laughing a deep ha-ha, the blizzard whirled in. Barely in time to save herself, Lara jumped awake. Then she did not dare to sleep again. She lay still and small in the dark, and all around her the black darkness of night that had always been restful and kind to her was now a horror. She had never been afraid of the dark. I am not afraid of the dark, she said to herself over and over. But she felt that the dark would catch her with claws and teeth if it could hear her move or breathe. Inside the walls, under the roof, where the nails were clumps of frost, even under the covers where she huddled, the dark was crouched and listening. In previous novels, as we've seen, Wilder depicted the natural world as ambivalent, unconcerned with human activity. Here in the long winter, the natural world, at least from her character's perspectives, is bent on destroying human life. The Ingalls family takes this threat very personally, and as the winter progresses, Laura and Pa in particular rage against it. Toward the end of the novel, cold and weak, facing the prospect of starvation, a raging four-day blizzard strikes. Pa rose with a deep breath. Well, here it is again. Then suddenly he shook his clenched fist at the northwest. Howl, blast you, howl, he shouted. We're all here safe. You can't get at us. You've tried all winter, but we'll beat you yet. We'll be right here when spring comes. Charles, Charles, Ma said soothingly. It is only a blizzard. We're used to them. Pa dropped back in his chair. After a minute, he said, That was foolish, Caroline. Seemed for a minute like the wind was something alive, something trying to get at us. It does seem so sometimes. This personification of the natural world reflects an idea Wilder has touched on in earlier novels in the series. But in the long winter, she refines and amplifies it. And that idea relates both to Laura and Pa's instinctive understanding of the West 
and the natural world it embodies. Pa reads the signs nature provides, that a hard winter is coming, that muskrat house in the opening chapters, the geese flying over Silver Lake in chapter two. Laura, too, has an affinity for the natural world, even when it is destructive. Laura loved the beautiful world. She knew that the bitter frost had killed the hay in the garden, the tangled tomato vines with their red and green tomatoes and the pumpkin vines holding their broad leaves over the green young pumpkins were all glittering bright in frost over the broken frosty sod. The sod corn stalks and long leaves were white. The frost had killed them. It would leave every living green thing dead. But the frost was beautiful. Laura and Pa's affinity for the natural world makes them feel its ambivalence and heartlessness more keenly. They understand its power and fury far better than Ma or Mary. Laura and Pa recognize more fully just how vulnerable the family is to the winter's malignant power to destroy human life. I want to come back to this point in a moment, but first, another observation about Wilder's depiction of the natural world in the long winter. Remember the scene from By the Shores of Silver Lake when Big Jerry and his white horse ride west into the sun. It was an archetypal moment for Laura. Somehow that moment when the beautiful free pony and the wild man rode into the sun would last forever. It was Laura's simultaneous introduction to the West and her farewell because she, her family, and ultimately the hundreds of pioneers streaming into Dakota territory were setting out to tame it. In the long winter, the natural world, the West, seems to launch an assault on humanity, one last epic struggle to shake off civilization. And in fact, the settlers themselves have made themselves more vulnerable to nature's ambivalence. The settlers in Dakota Territory during the winter of 1880 and 1881 aren't independent and self-sufficient pioneers. Instead, they depend on technology, the railroad, to deliver the food, fuel, and supplies they need to survive. In the opening chapter of The Long Winter, Pa tells Laura, we're humans and God created us free. That means we've got to take care of ourselves. But technology betrays the little town of DeSmet. It's virtually helpless against the malignant power of the West, at least during the hard winter. In the chapter alone, when Paul learns that there will be no more trains until spring, he says, the snow strikes like buckshot, and listen to that wind howl. I suppose this is blocking the trains, Ma said. Well, we've lived without a railroad, Pa answered cheerfully. But he gave Ma the look that warned her to say no more about it while the girls were listening. Laura, however, knows that look well and what it means. At the end of the chapter, she lies awake, considering the town's isolation and powerlessness. A lamp could shine out through the blackest darkness, and a shout could be heard a long way, but no light and no cry could reach through a storm that had wild voices and an unnatural light of its own. The blankets were warm, and Lara was no longer cold, but she shivered. 